Hello everyone. Welcome to this Royal Society of Tasmania webinar. I'm Jocelyn McPhee, the Vice President. I'm standing in this afternoon for President Mary Kuhlhoff, who's uh, having a break. Today we are meeting on the country of the First Nations of Lutruwita, Tasmania. The Royal Society of Tasmania acknowledges with deep respect the traditional owners of this land and the ongoing custodianship of the Aboriginal people of Tasmania. The society pays respect to elders past, present and emerging. We acknowledge that Tasmanian Aboriginal people have suffered severe and unjust impacts resulting from invasion and dispossession of their country. As an institution dedicated to the advancement of knowledge, the Royal Society of Tasmania recognises Aboriginal cultural knowledge and practices and seeks to respect and honour these traditions and the deep understanding they represent. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Just a few points about the webinar before we get going. It's being recorded and the chat function is disabled. The Q&A function, however, is working. And if you have questions, please type them into the, the Q&A window and I'll ask as many of them as I can at the end of um, at the end of the lecture. So today our, our speaker is Dr. Alessandro Silvano. Uh, Alessandro is presently a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Southampton in the UK, but he's speaking to us from Italy. And not only is he giving us this lecture quite early on a Sunday morning, it's also during his holiday break. So we're especially grateful he's made himself available uh, for this lecture. Alessandro did his PhD at the University of Tasmania and also with uh, CSIRO, where he worked on ice ocean interaction in East Antarctica with a focus on the Totten Glacier. He was one of the two winners of our doctoral awards last year, the Royal Society of Tasmania Doctoral Awards. Um, and he's moved on in his new position to looking at how currents in the Southern Ocean regulate the ocean, oceanic heat transport towards the Antarctic ice sheet, causing ice melting and sea level rise. The title of Alessandro's lecture is The Global Influence of Ice Ocean Interaction in Antarctica. And I'll hand over to Alessandro now. Thanks, Jocelyn. Um... I'm very happy to be here, uh, I mean, online, and honor for the awards. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm happy to be here, even if I'm on holiday. Uh, but yes, very, very happy. Okay, so, so first of all, I would like to thank and acknowledge my supervisors during the PhD, Steve Rentoul uh, and Bea Peña Molina from CSIRO and Guy Williams from Utah's, uh, their help and support uh, were very important and helpful for the PhD. Okay, um, so today I will try to explain why Antarctica is important uh, to all of us uh, and why it will be even more important in the future. So first of all, Antarctica is a continent. So it's, uh, it's quite large, it's larger than Australia, as you can see in this map. And also it's um, covered by ice. So if this ice, was to melt, we would have more than 60 meters of sea level rise. You can see here the major ice sheets uh, in the world. There is one in Greenland, the Greenland ice sheet, uh, which stores roughly the equivalent of seven meters of sea level rise. But you can see how most of the fresh water that is frozen on Earth is stored in Antarctica. And you can see there are two main regions of the ice sheet, the West Antarctic ice sheet and the East Antarctic ice sheet. Uh, and you can see from these numbers uh, how the East Antarctica is actually the main potential contributor to sea level rise in the future if it melts. Uh, 
but of course we won't see this kind of sea level rise in the coming decades or probably one century. But definitely it's important to understand what happens to Antarctica in the future. So this is a, one of the, the main region that could potentially be affected by high sea level rise. It's already affected a little bit. Uh, is Florida in the United States. And you can see how the current, this is the current map of Southern Florida. You can see how five meters or 10 meters would really affect uh, the Southern part of the state. So this would be probably irreversible in terms of living. Uh, it would be very, very, I would say impossible to live, for example, in Miami uh, there. Of course, we, want, we don't expect to see 10 meters of sea level rise soon, but it's something that we can commit if, if the uh, current anthropogenic forcing will continue. Um, the Antarctic system is, the physical system is characterized by the ocean, the Southern Ocean here uh, in yellow, uh, the sea ice, which forms when the surface of the ocean freezes, uh, and then the Antarctic ice sheet, uh, which is where the fresh water is frozen, but is also grounded to the floor here. Uh, a very important part of the system is the ice shelf. So the Antarctic ice sheet tends to flow from the center to the boundary and it ends in a floating portion called ice shelf. This ice shelf is what interacts with the ocean uh, and if there is warm water below uh, beneath it you can actually observe rapid melting which also will affect the uh, mass balance of the Antarctic ice sheet. So in, the, in Antarctica most of the melting happens uh, because of, of the ocean. Uh, in, indeed the atmosphere is pretty cold most of the year. So this is different from Greenland, for example. Uh, so what we have in Antarctica is that warm water is able to reach the base of the ice sheet and, and melting from below. Um, so I will talk about two main things uh, and why Antarctica is important. And in particular, the interaction between the Southern Ocean and the Antarctic ice sheet. We know that uh, this interaction affects the sea level rise, as I mentioned, but also the global ocean circulation. And I will explain why this is also very important for the climate of the Earth. Uh, I'm going to start with the sea level rise. So at the moment, this is a map of the present uh, mass loss or melting of the ice sheet, where you see red, it means that it's rapidly melting. And most of the melting at present day is happening in West Antarctica, in the uh, south of the Pacific Ocean, in particular in this area called the Amundsen Sea sector of the ice sheet. Uh, at present, roughly three millimeter per decade or 10% of the total sea level rise is caused by melting of ice in Antarctica, but projections suggest that it will become in the next decades the main contributor along with the Greenland ice sheet uh, to sea level rise. So it's very important to understand what happens in Antarctica to be able to predict the future. Uh, and also you can see that there is a particular glacier in East Antarctica, the Totten Glacier, that it appears to melt uh, as well. Uh, again, this melting is driven by what warm water that is able to reach the ice shelf and, and drive melting from below. At, uh, what we know, uh, what we knew up until a couple of years ago was that the melting in the West Antarctica was caused by warm water because there were observations from there uh, with ships that were able to reach the front of the glaciers and measure the ocean. But we didn't know what was happening in uh, in East Antarctica, and in particular, the Totten Glacier. We knew that it was melting from satellite observations, but we didn't know what was the driver up until a few years ago. Uh, and this was when there was the first uh, cruise that was able to reach the front, the, the front of, the, um, of the glacier here. Uh, and there were a couple of attempts before, uh, but the problem of this region is that there is a lot of sea ice even in summer. So what you see in, uh, in north of the glacier is sea ice. It's, it's very hard to get through. And indeed, the only the Aurora Australis uh, was able for the first time uh, in 2015 to reach the front. So it was, uh, I wasn't there, unfortunately, but it was kind of a, an epic voyage. So the red line here is the cruise track. Um, uh, and they were able to wait a little bit in this area of open ocean, so where there was no sea ice. This area is called Polinia. Uh, and they waited for a crack to open in front of the glacier. Uh, 
they waited, I think, a couple of two weeks or 10 days to for this crack to open. And when it opened, they went through and they had 48 hours roughly to go through this crack here. These are several tens of kilometers. So they had to go through this crack very narrow in front of the glacier, reach the front, measure, and go away before the, the weather changed and push the sea ice back to the front of the glacier. So it was quite a uh, difficult operation. Uh, but was very successful. Um, and the Australians were able to measure for the first time the ocean in front of this very important glacier, the Totten Glacier and the ice shelf, the floating part. And these are these dots that you can see on the left plot are um, uh, stations where it was possible to measure the ocean properties from the surface to the bottom. Uh, and what we found is that there was warm water or relatively warm water in a couple of canyons uh, in front of the glacier. So the water roughly, the seawater roughly freezes at minus two uh, because it's salty. Uh, and we found water that is two, about two degrees or 1.5 degrees above the freezing point. So for standard Antarctic uh, regions, this is high, high temperature because it's able to melt it from below quite rapidly. Uh, and this was a very important discovery because what we discover is that also East Antarctica can be susceptible to melting, uh, and in particular the Totten Glacier, which alone, alone uh, stores the equivalent of four meters of sea level rise. So this was a very, very important discovery, it's kind of a scary discovery for the climate system in general, I would say. Uh, we also discovered, so the, the black uh, area is the seafloor, the seafloor depth. Uh, which in the canyons is roughly 1,000 meters. And this, this is much deeper than, than what we thought with uh, the, uh, the yellow line and the white line were our previous estimates of the seafloor. And we didn't know that it was so deep. And in Antarctica, what happens is that the warm water is actually found deep uh, in the ocean because it's also very salty. So this, uh, the saltiness is what determines the density of the water in, in Antarctica. And so this water is very warm and salty is coming from the north, from other ocean basins, and is able to reach the Totten Glacier. Uh, we also made many other measurements using uh, a very, you know, state-of-the-art uh, instruments. We used observations from the ship. We lower some uh, devices to measure the oceans, for example, salinity and temperature, but we also use moorings, so we have year-round observations. And we also use these uh, underwater uh, floats that are autonomous and are able to measure the ocean even beneath the sea ice. So this is quite a new instrument. And we also use measurements collected by seals. So there are, these seals are instrumented with uh, small sensors that are able to measure the ocean properties. And the seals actually go very deep. They can reach 2000 meters and collect very, very important data. Uh, these are some of the data that we collected in the top 10 region. Uh, and uh, we discovered many things. And what I think what is very interesting is the fact that we were able to observe this warm water for a couple of years and see if it was there all the time or not, these kind of things. And we actually observed that the water is always warm in front of the Totten Glacier. It's a bit warmer in winter, but uh, the fact that there is always warm water, it means that there is strong potential for rapid melting in, uh, in the Totten area. So the conclusion of this first part of the talk is, is that not only the West Antarctic ice sheet or Greenland ice sheet are susceptible to rapid melting, but also the East Antarctic ice sheet. And as, you know, as we know, there is much more ice in East Antarctica uh, than in the other ice sheets. And therefore, it's, it's, it's very important to understand what is going to happen in the future. At the moment, it appears that in East Antarctica, only the Totten Glacier area is susceptible to rapid melting, but we don't know what is going to happen in the future in other places with changes in the atmosphere or other processes. Okay, so this was the first part. It was mostly focusing on sea level rise, which is something that is very important for the coastal community, also in Australia, in places like Sydney, for example. But what happens in Antarctica is also important in terms of global warming uh, and temperature in the atmosphere. Uh, because what happens here affects the ocean circulation. And um, 
uh, if we go to these two schematics, uh, we can see roughly a, um, a picture of the circulation in Antarctica. We have warm water that is coming from the north, from other ocean basin that is able to go up, shoal, reach the surface because driven by wind processes. And here, the, the water that is warm and relatively salty uh, interacts with the atmosphere in the coastal regions in Polinias. And um, the, the atmosphere is very cold in Antarctica and therefore it tends to freeze. So there's freezing of water and sea ice forms. During this process, we have two main important things. One is cooling of the water because it loses heat to the atmosphere. But also when there is sea ice formation, some salt is rejected from the sea ice into the ocean. So the water gets both cooler and saltier, which is the perfect recipe to, to produce a very dense and heavy water that then sinks into the abyss and to form Antarctic bottom water. So this, we call it Antarctic bottom water. This water fills the ocean abyss below roughly two to 3000 meters. And um, it's very important because this process brings carbon in particular and also heat uh, into the deep ocean and stores uh, the anthropogenic carbon in particular there for many centuries. So this circulation is very important to remove CO2 from the atmosphere and store it in the abyss for many centuries. Uh, so if there is a change in the circulation, this would really affect the CO2 concentration of the atmosphere and therefore global warming. Uh, there is also the fact that this water that forms near Antarctica is very cold and therefore the melting of the ice is also low. So glaciers nearby areas where there is this cold water are not melting fast. So they are in, in balance basically. Uh, and this process happens in many regions or several regions, I would say, around Antarctica. These blue dots here are regions where you can see that there is this cold water formation and bottom water formation. And also you can see this was the map of ice melting. You can see that in these regions, there is not much melting uh, of the ice. So no contribution to sea level rise uh, at the moment. Um, but there are also a couple of places, as I was talking before, that are warm. So this cold water is not there. And indeed, we can sort of um, think about two regimes in Antarctica. One is the warm regime, where you have warm water that is melting the, the glaciers, like the Totten or the West Antarctica. But we also have, in many regions, actually in most of the regions, we have cold water formation and bottom water formation. So we have this very dense water that fills the abyss, but the water is also cold. So the melting of the glacier is low. Of course, uh, there is the question what determines uh, if a place is warm or cold. And in particular, why the Totten Glacier area is, wa is warm. Uh, we actually thought may maybe 10 years ago that the Totten region was just cold. Uh, but it was, it was not the case. And so we asked ourselves why. Um, and so we use our observations that we collected uh, near the Totten Glacier to test an hypothesis. So as I, as I explained before, when sea ice forms, there is cooling, but also there is salt input into the ocean, uh, the yellow part here, that makes the water very salty and very dense. So our question was, is it possible that the rapid melting of the glaciers can offset this salt input and therefore stopping the bottom water formation. So you have salt input from the surface because of sea ice, but this doesn't really matter because it's balanced by rapid melting of the glaciers. Uh, and therefore the water is not able to get dense enough. So we use several observations that we collected to test this hypothesis. Uh, we actually found that the, the, there is almost a balance between the salt input from sea ice and the fresh water input from melting glaciers. And therefore, yes, so the, this is actually true. So the rapid melting in the Totten area and also in West Antarctica is preventing this cold water to form. Uh, and this is very important for two reasons. One is that it stops this formation of very dense water that goes into the abyss and this affects the CO2 and the carbon because it causes a reduction of carbon uptake by the ocean, but it also creates what we call a feedback because uh, if the water is warm, then the, the glaciers melt, but if, if, if the glacier melts more, then the water is gonna get warmer because of this process and so on. 
So this is a, what we call indeed a positive feedback, uh, where more melting leads to ocean warming, which then leads to more melting uh, and so on. And this is kind of a, an important uh, process. I think uh, in the present, it, it is important, but we know it was very important during past periods. Uh, so some scientists, paleoclimate scientists, they studied the past uh, to try to understand the climate of the past millennia and millions of years um, to be able to understand the main processes that could affect also the future of our planet. And there was an interesting, a, a interesting time, roughly 15,000 years ago, uh, when the, uh, the sea level, there was a very rapid abrupt sea level rise some estimates suggest even five meters per century. So five meters per century is an enormous amount of sea level rise. If you consider the past sea level rise during the 20th century was roughly 20 centimeter, 0 0.2 meters. So just think about what five meters could mean. Uh, the pro our projection at the moment suggests one meter or so roughly uh, for the next century up uh, 2100. Uh, so we don't expect this kind of five meters. But the main process that scientists think was important during this time called meltwater pulse uh, about 15,000 years ago was this feedback that I mentioned before, where the ocean uh, starts to melt the ice and the ice feedback into the ocean uh, and the temperature of the ocean increases, it, it creates a feedback uh, that can very rapidly increase the melting of the ice in Antarctica and cause very rapid sea level rise. Uh, so this is um, something that we need to better understand uh, and see if this kind of process could happen. At the moment, we know that it happens in a couple of regions sorry, around Antarctica. It happens in the Totten Glacier here, which is quite a restricted area for East Antarctica. It's just a couple of the Totten Glacier plus a couple of glaciers uh, nearby it. Uh, and it happens in, uh, in West Antarctica. But of course, the big question for us, I think, is what happens in the other places? Is it possible that these places will become uh, also warm? And that would affect both the sea level rise and the ocean circulation, as, as I mentioned. Um, and um, OK, so I think I can go to the conclusion so I don't introduce too many concepts uh, for the presentation. Uh, so what uh, what we discovered during my PhD and the work with uh, my PhD supervisors was that imp very important, I think, discoveries for, for the climate system. The first one is that East Antarctica and the ice sheet uh, of East Antarctica are susceptible to rapid melting by the ocean. This was highly unexpected. In fact, if, if we see at the, at the literature of scientists maybe ten, even less than 10 years ago, East Antarctica was not even mentioned. Uh, people were thinking mostly of Greenland, uh, where the air temperature is very high in summer, so rapid melting at the surface, or West Antarctica, where there is melting from the ocean, from beneath it. Uh, but we show that also the East Antarctica sheet is potentially very important. And also there is some evidence uh, of retreat in East Antarctica, even in past, during past climates that are similar to ours. Um, and in particular, the projections for the next 50 to 100 years suggest that East Antarctica might be a main contributor to sea level rise. Uh, but also we didn't stop uh, uh, at the sea level rise, but we also, and we still think about what happens in terms of feedbacks between the ice sheet and the ocean. And in particular, what, uh, what's the impact of increased melting on the ocean circulation? And, um, and we observed that in a couple of regions uh, today, the rapid melting is enough to stop this very dense and uh, salty cold bottom water formation. Uh, this Antarctic bottom water, as I, as I mentioned, fill uh, the abyss of the entire ocean mostly, uh, and is able to store carbon for many centuries even millennia. Um, and if there is like a disruption to this uh, circulation because of increased melting, this would, this would be very um, worrying in terms of carbon in the, at, uh, in the atmosphere because 
uh, at present day, a large portion of the anthropogenic carbon is then uh, absorbed by the ocean. But this can change uh, if there is uh, if there are substantial changes in the circulation. And this indeed uh, is what is highlighted in this, is in this last point is the what I call the Antarctic feedback between a warming ocean and an increased melting that can affect, as I said, both the sea level rise but also the ocean circulation. And I think that the connection between sea level rise and ocean circulation is something that is um, was kind of pushed during the PhD thesis and is, I, I believe is a very important topic for, for oceanographers in general uh, and climate, science, cl climate scientists uh, also. And um, okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Alessandro. So as I mentioned before, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A uh, window and um, we'll ask as many as we possibly can. Now, I just wanted to uh, start with, with one, Alessandro. You mentioned that it could be possible for some of the other glaciers in East Antarctica to begin rapidly melting. Is, there, is, is this something that's monitored? Is there kind of regular measuring of uh, the water and the ice to try to tell whether more rapid melting has actually started? Yeah, uh, so the, the short answer is we don't know in the sense that um, East Antarctica is uh, in terms of claiming by nations is mostly claimed by Australia and is a huge territory and it's impossible, virtually impossible by a single nation to monitor it, all, all of it. So uh, um, the scientists in Australia need to par have priorities in terms of where to go. Uh, and definitely we know at the moment that the Totten Glacier is very, very important because from satellites we know that it's losing mass and melting. There are some observations collected by the seals uh, that uh, went there in other places. So we found some evidence or, or a couple of measurements near other glaciers, for example, here, uh, just west, to the, uh, west of the Totten, where there is some warm water there. Uh, but uh, without a, a campaign, uh, it's, it's hard to confirm it. So we would need to make, uh, to have oceanographic campaigns, uh, probably in collaboration with other nations to observe, to try to observe other regions, in particular, the regions to the, I, I believe, the regions to the, to the west uh, of the Totten Glacier, near, um, between Perth's Bay and the Totten is, is a region that is potentially uh, at risk. Uh, there is also a little bit of evidence of retreat uh, instead to the east of the Totten Glacier in the Delhi coast, uh, which is roughly south of Tasmania, uh, but this is from the past. So we have some evidence that it retreated during past warm climates. At present day, we didn't find any evidence of warm water uh, reaching the glaciers. But again, we have just measurements in few uh, areas, not, uh, not everywhere. So it's an open question, I would say. Thank you. Uh, we have one exploring the comparison between the, the results that you have based on measurements versus what computer simulations produce. I, is there a similar uh, result generated by that different approach? Yeah, so, so the answer is that uh, the, at, the, at present day models uh, struggles in reproducing everything that happens near uh, near the coast of Antarctica and if you think about if I go back to the schematic uh, you, a model needs to reproduce the ocean but also the sea ice the icebergs the ice shelf and the ice sheet so then it's a coupled system so you need to be able to simulate everything and how they interact and uh, the model are starting to be able to do this, but on, I would say on a regional scale. So regional models can reproduce these processes 
uh, so regional, I mean, for example, you take the top 10 area and you make a simulation of that area. Uh, but on a circumpolar scale, we still we are still far, I think, from being able to reproduce everything. So we are, I think there is a strong improvement in terms of modeling, uh, but still we need to upscale and try to reproduce all the Antarctic ice sheet and the Southern Ocean. So I think this is the next step in terms of modeling. So some processes are, are reproduced mostly by these regional models, but the large scale model is still a struggle and the climate model as well. Thank you. Now, if we stopped warming now, if, if we reversed the climate change that's already happened, how long would it take current ice reserves to recover? It's probably a really tricky yeah. question that goes well beyond your research, but it might be something you could comment on. I mean, that's, I think that's one of the main questions that uh, uh, Antarctic scientists are asking. <laughs> uh, but so there is, in terms of commitment, so the commitment is already there. So even if we stop today emitting carbon, into the atmosphere, there is a, com a commitment to future sea level rise because the ice sheet is, is a very slow moving um, fluid. So the response of the ice is, is long. It takes centuries to adapt, to adjust, to uh, change in the climate. So we know that we are quite sure that um, some glaciers in uh, West Antarctica are committed to a retreat even if there is even cooling of the ocean, uh, but probably uh, because of the configuration and the dynamics of the ice. So even if we stop today emitting, we will have some, I think some tens of centimeters coming from uh, the West Antarctic ice sheet uh, because um, there is an irreversible retreat there. Um, but if we keep emitting, we will not talk about several tens of centimeters, but we will talk about maybe in a, in a couple of centuries, several meters, uh, because other parts of the ice sheet can become unstable. Uh, like, as I mentioned, the Adeli cost could be. Uh, and also we could have, at the moment, we are only talking about melting from the ocean, but if the atmosphere starts to, uh, to warm it also, there will be a worry as well. Um, so there is also the, the fact that an increasing carbon in the atmosphere and the greenhouse effect could also cause an increase in the temperature that would affect the coastal regions and therefore there would be even more uh, melting. So what I would say is we are already committed to some, but humanity can adjust so we can adapt to that kind of sea level rise. However, if we keep emitting for decades, uh, it, it can become very hard for coastal communities to adapt uh, around the world. So that we, we, we expect some sea level rise no matter what we do, uh, but if we don't do anything, it can be much worse. Right. Is there anything to be um, learnt on that topic of how long it takes things to change from that example that you gave of the meltwater pulse at 15,000 years ago, is there, do you know how long it lasted? So the very rapid sea level rise lasted a few centuries, maybe two. Right, okay, uh, yeah. But of course, you cannot go back very rapidly because the, the ice needs to grow again and yeah. it takes centuries and millennia. So we know that it can, it can you can have abrupt sea level rise, but usually to recover, you know, it takes longer. Right. Or... Okay. And then finally, what, what would be your top three priorities in future Antarctic science? So some I, I mentioned before are uh, trying to coordinate campaigns in, in areas that are currently uncharted, basically and most of these areas are in East Antarctica. Uh, and we need to know more. We need to know if other regions can start to melt rapidly. And this can be done, I think, only with uh, a dedicated campaign. Uh, 
by sheep, uh, I think. So this is one. And the second one is to keep, and the, the community is pushing, is to keep improving the models uh, that are uh, trying to simulate the future of the system. And so improving and being able to reach the, the entire southern ocean and, and probably going globally uh, and try to always improve the model. It's something that a large portion of the community is, is doing and that we uh, still need to be done uh, for many aspects. And also I, what I think is, I talked mostly about physical stuff, okay? Uh, ocean temperature, uh, melting of ice, but of course the earth is, is not a physical system, it's also a biological system. So how all of this affects the biology, uh, the ecosystems uh, needs to be better understood and probably a better and improved, I would say, collaboration between physical scientists and biological scientists and um, scientists that works in the ecosystems is something that also needs, I think, uh, needs a, a step forward. It's still a, it's already happening, but it's, it's going to become more and more important as we, and as we see rapid change. Okay, thanks very much, Alessandro. We'll we'll stop there. Um, and leave the questions. Could I ask you to put on the closing slide? Uh, and at this point, um, it's my pleasure to thank you very much for your talk today and all the trouble you went to to make a very complicated story relatively straightforward. And also to offer congratulations on being a winner of one of our doctoral awards. Under normal circumstances, um, I'd be offering you the certificate and the, the cash that goes with that award. Um, but since you're in Italy and we're, I'm in Tasmania, that'll have to be something that goes uh, via the mail. But well done, Alessandro. It was a particularly strong field last year in the doctoral awards, and um, you were one of one of the two clear winners in that in that competition. So, if you have any final words, now's the time. No, I would like just to thank you for the award, of course, and for the possibility to talk here. I would like to come back to Australia. I still have one bag there that I need to get. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I really, I really hope to be to be able to come back soon. Thanks very much, Alessandro. So thank you all for attending and for your participation this afternoon. The next lecture, the next Royal Society of Tasmania lecture, is actually on next Sunday at one thirty. That's brought to us from the northern branch of the Royal Society of Tasmania. So if you go to our website, you can see um, on the screen the website address, then you can find the information about that lecture and sign up if you would like to um, attend either in person or online. And that's all. Thank you very much. And I'll now end the session. <laughs>